Um. Good day, everyone. My name is Jim Manico. I'm going to be your presenter for this talk. It is 2.20 in the morning for me in the Pacific of the United States. I am tired. I'm a little bit cranky. So you need to pay attention because we're going to work on a technique or a series of techniques for secure coding. We're going to learn about request forgery in a browser. And we're going to learn about request forgery on a server. I'm a little bit cranky this morning, so I apologize. But we're, let's get to work here. My name is Jim Manico. I'll be your presenter. And w let's look at the traditional forgery first. Let's look at cross-site request forgery. First, of, this is a clothing optional talk, by the way. Just let's, let's, you know, clothing optional. So, okay, so you're in the browser, and you go visit an attacker's website as a victim. And then that attacker website can deliver code into your browser that will force your browser to make a request to another website. And especially if you're currently logged in to the victim website, that forge request in some situations will work. Again, this attack type cross site request forgery, it's a way to trick a user into conducting a request that they never intended to. In, this exa in these examples, it's about transferring money, deleting email, or even sending e sending email that the user never intended to, to do. Now let's look at this last example here. Imagine there's a vulnerability in this webmail system and I'm visiting, please note the site that I'm on here, right? I'm on an evil website, that's an attacker, that's bad, B-A-D, that's a bad website controlled by an attacker in some way and then I go visit this code. Now this code makes a request to some webmail site and it forces me to send email. And the destination is my boss. I'm gonna tell the boss they're a jerk. And I'm gonna use the rel the REL is no refer attribute. Now why am I using that attribute? So when I make a request, when I force a victim to make a request to webmail, it's not gonna leak the refer that would be e evil.com. So by saying this, I say, no, don't do a refer. And so there you go, that's where we're going. So it's forged requests on the web. So my question is, what's the result here? When the image loads, now look at this image. When the image loads, a get request is made, right? A get request is made to the banking application. And if a user is logged into the bank, the cookie is, if, the, if they're logged in and the cookie is valid, that cookie is going to be sent automatically. And if the user is logged in, the user is authenticated. Now, the attacker does not see the response. The attack launches in the browser of a victim. So does, does it matter that the attacker doesn't see the response? No, it doesn't. The attacker gets the result of this attack. They get the money. They get the message to be sent maliciously and similar. You know, let, let, let's keep looking at this. We're going to look at this from a lot of different angles, but look at this here. This is also an evil website. Bad. And so on this evil website, we have an iframe that's invisible. White width, height and border are all like zero so there's so it's so it's it's, it's an invisible iframe it's going to make a submission to this internal website and transfer money and there's the account and the money they're going to transfer and there's the form submitting automatically so let's put this all together think about this for a sec it's an evil website it makes an automatic request to your intranet website where you're logged in all day. The user doesn't see anything because I'm using style to make this invisible. And the submission happens automatically by JavaScript. This is messed up. This is a post request that's firing automatically. This is very, very bad. It's cross-site request forgery with the post request. 
In the US, one of our big movie streaming services is Netflix, right? When Netflix was attacked back in 2006, we wanna start at the body request here, start the body. So that when this page renders at some evil website, the first thing that happens is a get request goes to Netflix and adds that movie to the queue. That's now a movie, it's a DVD, that's at the very bottom of the queue. Then we wait two seconds and call load image two, which load image two is right there. That's gonna fire to Netflix, move to top a certain movie. So in this attack, we take a DVD, add it to the bottom of the DVD queue, and then move it to the top of the queue. And this becomes the next movie delivered to the home. And in the US, this movie was inappropriate for children. It was an adult movie. So in the US, that's a very big deal, I know. In I know in Poland, you probably just give it to your kids. Who cares? But this was a this is a, a this is a big deal in the US. It was inappropriate movies being delivered to people. And it shows us how request forgery can work. Nobody ordered these movies. They were ordered for them by an attacker. Now, look at this. Now we're getting a bit more serious. This is cross-site request forgery that shows up in a whole nation. This is an attack against Brazil. There were literally 5 million people impacted by this. 5 million throughout Brazil. And this attack also attacks an intranet. The attack goes after 192.168.1.1. That's an intranet address. And in Brazil, a third of the nation was using this router because they gave it to you for free. It's a free router when you order internet service in Brazil around this era in 2012. And, and if, you're, if you are connected to this router and you visit the internet and you run across this code, it's gonna automatically submit via JavaScript here. It's gonna to submit to a local address, the home of that router, and it's gonna change the root password to this password right there. And now the attacker knows your password. Now what the attacker did when he got access to this router is change your DNS. Oops, let's get rid of all that mess there. Let's go, let's get rid of all that mess. So it, 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 would, it would literally change the DNS of the server, of that little router. If I can change your DNS, you know, I control all of your web traffic. It's a really big deal. And so the point I'm trying to make is I can use cross-site request forgery to attack your intranet, to attack your internal network. I can host the attack in a web page outside of your network. And when, and when someone visits any website while being logged into single sign-on, that code can be delivered to the browser and trick the user into making any request on the intranet where people are logged in via single sign-on all day. This is bad, right? And so the way we stop cross-site request forgery is these two patterns here. It's the synchronizer token pattern for a web app or the double submit cookie pattern for a stateless API. We also have these other defenses like re-authentication is good. Just making the user log in before they fit, log in again before they finish a transaction, that's good. We also have same site cookies, which is a standard on the web which helps defeat request forgery. And the browser automatically sends some, re some headers, request headers, like an origin or a refer header, which we can verify to stop request forgery as well. All right, the first major pattern we care about is the synchronizer token pattern. It's a hidden token in HTML. So what this, what this means is at login time, when a user logs in, I'm gonna put a random value in the user session there, right? And then anytime I build a form, I'm gonna add a CSERF token to that sensitive form, the same value, right? And then whenever a user submits a sensitive request, I'm gonna compare the token in the session 
I'm going to see if it matches what's in the actual request. And if they match, then, then, then this is not an attack. This is a real request because the attacker, the, the attacker who's making a request from a different website, they have no idea what this token is going to be when you log in tomorrow. So they can't predict what that token value looks like. You should only need to do this when method is post, right? Because in theory, your get requests should not run transactions. Your get request should be item potent and null impotent. Should have no side effects. And it should have the same, every request should have the same effect. So it's just about reading data. Many of our frameworks do not protect get requests from CSERF protection because your get requests should not cause any harm, right? Your get request should just read data. A get request should not run a transaction. So that's the main defense, synchronizer token. The second defense is double cookie submit defense. Now, this is important when you have a stateless API, a stateless web service that still uses a browser. The way this defense works is when someone hits submit on a JavaScript client, this is like, right, this is like React or this is like Vue, right? Don't use Angular, it's garbage, but I use React and Vue, it's, what, it's my preference. And so when you hit submit on this, it's going to use JavaScript to create a cookie with an anti CSERF token in it, right? And then that same value is added to the request right there. And the, so the way this works is, the way this works is, there's no way the evil domain can read your cookie on your website. Remember, cookies are, are set up for one domain only. And if this defense requires the client to, re, to, to make a cookie in JavaScript and put that same value in the request, there's no way the attacker on an evil website can mess with your cookies. So this is why this defense works so well. We use cookie isolation. And again, with, sync, with, this, with the double cookie submit defense, we're gonna, in JavaScript, create a cookie on the fly and put that same value in the request. All the server does, the server just checks if the value is the same in the request and in the cookie. Now, there's some other defenses that we care about here, right? We also like, uh, what do we like here? We also like just forcing a user to log in. For example, if I was going to uh, do a financial transaction, like in a bank, transfer money, I'd make the user log in again before, uh, before I complete the transaction. It does impact the user experience, but it's very, very good security. Other defenses that we care about is the same site cookie, right? When you have a cookie, there's a lot of different things you can do here in terms of values, but it's this one value right here, the same site cookie. This is a cookie flag. It's either strict or lax. This will limit a cookie from leaving the browser unless the current page and the server are the same registrable domain. So this is about a rule. Will the cookie leave the browser? Whenever the cookie is about to, whenever a request is made from the browser, we're gonna compare, we're gonna compare uh, what page is the browser and what page is the server. And that need, they both need to match the domain of the cookie or the cookie is not gonna leave the browser. Remember the attack, it's hosted on an evil website. So the site is evil and the server is webmail. They're not the same site. So the request will not be sent. Uh, a few, so, and that's the same site cookie defense right there. The, and this is default as lax in the browser. If you do not set the same site value yourself, the browser will do it for you and make your cookie same site lax. 
there's two different kinds of same side cookie. They're strict and lax, right? Right there, strict and lax. If your cookie is strict, then the request needs to start from inside of a web page. If your cookie is lax, then the link can start in text or similar. So I, I digress. The same site cookie does a good job in stopping request forgery. A few notes is that uh, same site cookies are not going to work for non-cookie based session management. Like for example, HTTP basic and digest, if that's a problem, a uh, cookie's not going to help you. Network based session management, while rare, that, that's not going to, we're not going to be able to fix that problem. If you have a subdomain controlled by an adversary or a customer, they can use CSERF to attack the top level domain and not all browsers support same site. So same site is not perfect. Remember what I'm recommending is, is you use synchronizer token or double submit and these become optional, right? Same site cookie is not enough of a defense by itself. So let's put this, let's put this all together. What do we got here, right? The, the other thing that we can look at is we can also control, we can, uh, no, that, that's good, that's good. A few last notes. When we come to XSS, any time I inject JavaScript into your website, request forgery defense is all useless, right? A single flaw where I inject JavaScript into your site will let me undermine any any defense to stop request forgery and this happened to twitter a long time ago this was the attack the attack is right here it's all of this and this is the, how they launched the attack in a tweet they tweeted this out it got the the script was allowed to run from the attack they stole a copy of the token via javascript and re and there's the token right there the the up auth token and there they are reusing that auth token and reusing the auth token so they and they tweet it they force the user to tweet about goats so let's look at all this so if your framework supports csur protection go ahead and use it you for a stateful web app use synchronizer token for a stateless api use double submit cookies and then use do one of these defenses either do same site cookie um, re-authentication, you can verify the headers, match your domain, and similar. And remember, one cross-site scripting will defeat all CSERF defense. So one JavaScript injection, and this defense is useless. Also, don't use GET for state-changing operations. You shouldn't need to protect a GET. This is the summary for cross-site request forgery, and you should read that guide for more information. The other kind of forgery is server-side request forgery. This won't take that long to talk about. Server-side record forgery, it happened last in 2019 um, against Capital One, but we also saw this, uh, we also saw this um, at GitLab back in, 2000, in early 2021. GitLab had a major uh, uh, server-side request forgery. So did Microsoft Exchange have a big C serve? So this is a, a server side request forgery. This is a big problem. The way this works is you need to find a spot, a, a variable like this URL in the bank that does something called a server side include, right? What's a server side include? A server side include is when you have this parameter URL on the server it's going to load that url and embed it in the web page this comes up more often in microservices but in general you shouldn't do this but this happened to at amazon web service for capital one this url was meant to be like for news or something innocent but the attacker what, what did the attacker do here the attacker they change the URL in a Capital One website to an Amazon URL, right? This is part of Amazon Web Service, and it stole the credential file of the web application firewall. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? So I make a request to the server. I change a parameter 
And that parameter is something that the server acts on. So this is how you find this vulnerability. Find a parameter that the server is gonna use to, to make a request to look up data and then change that URL to be something in infrastructure or another request that, the, that, that you wanna forge to get, have the server forge. And now you have server side request forgery. What happened here was the attacker changed Capital One's URL. This is the Capital One breach is what we're talking about. The attacker changed a URL to an Amazon infrastructure reference, and that gave the attacker access to Capital One's Amazon account. The attacker logged into Amazon with this account. They went to their S3 bucket and they stole 100 million credit card applications. The way this works is, again, the request, here's the basic, uh, you know, old school API architecture, the request comes into the public API, that per, the, the parameter is manipulated, and now the path of how B happens. B is the public API making a request to an internal API. And we can use basic path traversal to manipulate that URL and change what the server is going to do. So here's all the, so here, I'm expecting that parameter 23. There's the parameter variable, and I'm gonna add that parameter var, I'm gonna add that to the URL, and I can just do path traversal, and that's the final hit that the server does. And I'm now able to change the path of how the server makes re request because of the feature that they built in securely. So if you're gonna build a URL like this, if you're gonna build a URL where some of that data is a variable from a different source, then you should build your URLs like this. You should, I'm, and I'm almost done folks, you should build your URLs so that parameter is encoded for the URL. These are you encode for URL path, because I'm putting it on a path here, URI. And this is encode for URI parameter. We're putting that parameter, um, uh, putting that variable on a parameter of a URL. Now, no matter what attack gets to that variable, we have encoded it so the path of the URL can't change. Here's my last, and by the way, here, here is some, some more information about server side request forgery. You should go look at, if you haven't already, Go look at Orange to Size talk right here. One of the best talks ever on server side request forgery. And here's my last slide. In order to have good server side request forgery defense, we want great authentication on our internal internet APIs. We want great access control on our, on our APIs. And if you have URLs as a parameter, you gotta validate that URL. Go back to what happened to Capital One for a second. Go back to this. How could they have fixed this? This URL. If that URL just said, if the URL starts with example.com slash, then that problem would have gone away. The answer would have been validate the URL to make sure it's only a URL that the server should act on. So, when a URL is a parameter, do strong URL validation, absolutely. Avoid taking a URL as a full parameter that the server acts on if you can get away with it. And build your URL safely using URL encoding. Also, when you have a web service, you can use network controls to limit what it's allowed to do and do micro segmentation these help a lot as well. Again, using putting network controls around services, limit what requests they can make. It's easy to do. That's an effective strategy as well. And guess what? I'm done. It has been a pleasure to give a talk to you this morning. I'm awake. I'm awake now. I'm awake. Does anybody have any questions before we finish up for today? Again, it's been my great pleasure to be here. I'm going to go back to the beach in a few minutes. But that's it for today. Who's with me? Is anyone there?